Okay, so this is going to be our lecture on the process of decision making in choosing a support strategy and this can be applied to um, sports psychologists, exercise psychologists or any kind of psychologist and um, we can think about it as a coach and I think many helping professions will use something like this as they decide how best to help a client. Uh, some of the background information around the underlying uh, ethics and philosophy we'll have to um, leave out of this but I'll try and signpost where those things might um, feed into this type of decision. And for the main part, there, this lecture is based on the book we've been using, mainly chapter 7, that's the uh, accessible part of our lecture. Um, but the surrounding chapters are obviously quite useful as well. So we're going to look at how, once you've got your information and you think you know what's going on with your client, how you can then transition to making a decision about how best to proceed or choosing a support strategy. In different uh, spheres you might hear it talked about as choosing an intervention or choosing uh, a treatment even, but I'm going to try and stick to the language of choosing a support strategy because that includes the less prescriptive approaches like counselling for example where you might simply help a client work out what to do um, without too much input from yourself apart from asking difficult um, and appropriate questions. So I'm going to try and say what is this thing called decision making and in particular choosing the support strategy. And then we're going to look at how um, that decision is informed by lots of other key pieces of information. To an extent lots of other decisions you've made along the way um, to lead to this big important decision. They can be in your case formulation, which will have been informed by the needs analysis process. Uh, that can be coming from evidence-based practice, whereby we as um, scientific helping professionals are supposed to be using the latest, most up-to-date and robust science to inform our practice. Uh, to what extent is that possible? And then, uh, if it's not possible, what are we left with instead? We're going to look at what is this thing called professional judgment? Um, it's often used to describe a category of um, stuff which is hidden and just left to be magical or gut feel. And I think um, it may be in a court of law level of um, analysis or even certainly scientific analysis. Obviously gut feel and um, leaving things unexplained and unexamined isn't always good enough. So where there is time and opportunity we probably could um, have a language for unpacking what is meant by professional judgment. Not just snap gut decisions, but there's probably something going on that we can give a language to analyse, understand and eventually do better. Um, wrapped up with professional judgments, there are the kind of practical constraints of despite all the best information, despite knowing what the science says and what the clients told me, sometimes there are practical constraints on what you can do and they're just as important as having a really good idea. So if the person has a really busy schedule or a particular key moment in the season or you know, a competitive cycle, you might not choose to do certain interventions or support strategies for that reason. So you're constrained by the context as well. And that's not to be overlooked, that's a really important aspect of it. Um, so we can talk about that openly and honestly and use that to explain why we've done stuff. The recurring theme is going to be that we are always looking to explain, show our workings, be accountable, uh, be defensible so that if we've made a decision it makes sense and we can stand by it at least insofar as with the information that we had at that time that we think was the best decision we could have made. If it turns out that there was other information we didn't have, some of that could be our fault because we didn't look. Sometimes circumstances simply change. Sometimes there were things you might not be expected to have known. But uh, we're not looking for right and wrong decisions, we're looking for the best possible or the least bad possible decisions in a key aspect of the um, support process. So it needs to be something we can uh, convey, put into words, uh, analyse and understand. This then transitions us into planning the support, which is probably a different lecture, but I wanted to spend a few minutes um, looking at what's involved in that. And because that also feeds back into the decision process, if, if you're trying to plan something and it simply um, is very difficult and it doesn't really work, that may mean that you've not got enough information, you haven't done a good enough analysis or you haven't understood the issue well enough. And then ultimately we're trying to do something, so we need to say how I deliver this thing to my client. 
And how will I know if I've done well or badly? So a nice broad overview, and that should hopefully get us in the door. And then there are, of course, some follow-up readings that we can direct you to. But this is just to give you an initial entry into this topic. It's not something which is written about very often. So hopefully at the end of this, you've got a uh, understanding, a framework, and some sensitivity to go and engage with uh, a fairly mixed literature and actually it, allow it to make sense rather than simply having to deal with some long words or some different viewpoints. Hopefully this will give you a good starting point, a good firm basis on which to build. When we think about the decision of you know, choosing what to do, an intervention or a support strategy, it's something which happens right at the heart of your consulting process. This is the model that I proposed in 2015 for a consulting process. As you can remember or see here, the very foundations of a sports psychologist's process are built on ethics and philosophy. So you need to get the ethics right before you can deliver good practice. You need to actually understand your own philosophy because that frames your own practice. It frames what you classify as good or bad and success and failure. So it's very important to have those things in place. And then broadly speaking, there'll be an entry moment called the intake where you establish a relationship and it's probably your last chance to say, this is not gonna work out, this isn't a good relationship. Once you're into that relationship, exiting it would be difficult. It involves some kind of untangling and some termination element. And that's not easy. So the intake is the last chance to say, this isn't for me. Then you can uh, work out your client's needs, what their goals and expectations are, and maybe perhaps any gaps in between what they're currently capable of and their desires and goals. Um, it could be that their pressures and context have changed, and again, that's created a kind of uh, tension or gap in, in what they're currently capable of. When you've done a thorough needs analysis, you normally end up with what I call a case formulation, where you can have a, a working model in your mind of what's going on, including the, the sort of inputs uh, and the uh, sort of circumstances, so the inputs to the system, the cogs and the connections in that system, so you can see how things interact, and then the outputs that are being generated, so that if you want to change the outputs, you could change the inputs or you could change the system. But it gives you this working model, and that model could be off the shelf or you know from a, a textbook or it could be something you've completely custom built for each individual client. There are criteria around um, what those models should look like, um, and so that it should effectively look a lot like a, a, a theory in that it, you know, it proposes um, hypotheses almost that you could test. It proposes if I do this, perhaps this outcome will um, occur. So you could test those. So in some ways it's actually something you it could be proven wrong, but that would be useful because you could then improve it and make it better. Uh, so if you have a case formulation that doesn't uh, contain and explain the information from your needs analysis uh, and your client's experiences, and it doesn't make predictions that you could actually test, the chances are it's not ready yet. When you've got that, one of the things it should be saying is, well then here's how you can achieve the outcomes that you want. So it could be fixing a problem, it could be achieving some new impressive capability, it could be resolving some tension. But it starts to point you towards some potential interventions and support strategies. That is a key decision uh, informed by at least three sources of information, the case formulation itself, evidence-based practice, professional judgments. And it's all happening in the, in the very heart, which I think is therefore harder to get to, harder to access and understand. It's in the middle of this dense process. Hopefully if you get that decision right and clean, then you can plan an intervention and deliver that intervention. And that doesn't um, belie the fact that all of these processes are richly interacting. It's not actually, as sketched here, a linear in and out process. Um, information from the right hand side of the page could be uh, influencing and feeding back into information on the left-hand side of the page. It's richly interacting all the time, and it's richly informed by ethics, philosophy, ongoing reflective practice. It's a live, complex system, um, and I have proposed it as such. So if you see this as purely a linear uh, model, that's not how I've intended this to be interpreted. 
So we can define it, uh, operationally at least, as a process wherein one course of action uh, is selected from many. And that course of action might be you know, formally an intervention or a treatment. And that's effectively the moment where we choose how to proceed. Uh, and we think we're moving from gathering information to making a change. So it's potentially a big decision because ultimately the results you achieve are what you're judged on and perhaps what the profession is judged on. And it's potentially a very big decision because, you know, I think I've said it before, but if you uh, were to take a drug that changed the way you think, that'd be a big thing. You'd want to know, well, how does it work? Has it been tested properly? Um, how will it affect me in day-to-day -day life? Would you give it to your own kids? You'd want to really know that it's been tested and it works and it's likely to work for this for you. So uh, even though it's only you know psychology and sometimes it's just doing a diary or something like that, I think it's worth pausing and, and really reflecting on you know how would I convey this to my client, to my supervisor, to my regulator? How would I explain this really important, really influential decision? Uh, and if I can do that well, the chances are either I'm already doing good practice or I and I can learn how to do it differently and better in future. But if I can't even explain that process, it's very difficult to know how you're going to learn to get better at it. So I alluded to this in a, sec a second ago, but I think we as individuals and as a profession are judged on the quality of the outcomes that we generate. Um, and even if sometimes the outcomes aren't there, people want to be able to see um, where they've come from. And if it didn't work, then they can be dismissive of, um, you know, maybe it was the time constraints, maybe it was uh, we didn't have the sort of these analysis right in the first place. Maybe the person didn't actually uh, run with and do what they knew was going to work, but they just didn't do it because they had other stuff in their life. If our workings are clearly shown, and not only us, but everyone involved can see our logic, we're more likely to be forgiven uh, for anything that doesn't work. If, however, it's all just magic and it's some property of the person who's magically dreaming up these interventions and support strategies and they end up being wrong, then it's the person who's wrong. Um, and you know, perhaps by extension sometimes the uh, profession. And that's not necessarily a logical, um, rational thought process. That is just how people tend to judge things. So, uh, important to emphasize that, that, that therefore this transparency and accountability may actually benefit the practitioner and the whole profession if we're able to convey it well and share it and analyze it and talk about it. Um, because those decisions about you know what's good or bad can be quite subjective. Um, in fact, the scientific process you know, effectively exists because we know human beings are particularly flawed decision makers, and we tend to gravitate towards all sorts of irrational superstitions and uh, you know flawed uh, conclusions. And so we introduced science to try and overcome that. Uh, so being scientific in our practice avoids the same errors in terms of superstitions and false beliefs and irrational uh, approaches. At its heart, we're supposed to be doing a scientific process. Uh, the quality of the outcome and the quality of the decision are closely related, and the quality of the decision is obviously heavily dependent on all the other information that you've got. Your needs analysis, case formulation, your previous experiences, your knowledge of the literature, all of those things are going to feed in. If any of those are deficient or not up to date or incomplete, then the quality of your decision could be affected. And if you don't even pay attention to those things, you don't even monitor and check whether you're up to date with the literature or whether you've got sufficient information about the client, then we're waiting for a problem to occur. We're just leaving it to chance. And again, with a scientific process, this probably shouldn't be something we just leave to chance. So my main theme here is that if you know what you did, you can explain it, you can tell other people, uh, that means that you're either already doing a good job or you can continue to improve and analyze 
and learn how different contexts affect things and eventually you'll be better. Problem is here, we have very little language of how to describe this vital process. Um, it's something which actually there are common themes and we can try and slice it different ways but it's not something with a common uh, shared vocabulary where when people start talking about the very crux of a decision and how it was made we often don't have a language, we don't know what they're talking about and we're left groping around looking for words. So one of the things I've tried to do is to actually invent a vocabulary to try and characterise these decisions, these key decisions when you're trying to help a client. And those come down to things like when was the decision made in the support process? Was it made um, right at the moment that it was necessary? Was it made with quite a lot of sort of cold rational withdrawal? Um, sometimes you actually don't make a decision, sometimes you uh, entertain three or four options and wait for other things to fall into place. And that would be kind of almost a madeness uh, word. You know, how made is the decision? Is it something you've decided and gone with? Or have you actually still got three options and you're waiting for other information? Or you're waiting for uh, a key event to happen before you decide? There's still a decision in there. It's just um, how made is it? How final is it? Uh, there's a classic literature around the certainty of the outcomes, so it's basically drawn from gambling and gaming theory. So people start to play with how certain or uncertain are the outcomes of this decision that I'm making versus what are the risks of these decisions. Um, so a classic example, uh, Pascal's wager, if I'm getting this right, it would be that um, it's very little certainty around whether there is or isn't um, a god. But the risk of being wrong is so big, eternal damnation, that you may as well believe. Because even though you couldn't possibly know, um, the consequences are just that bad. And that's an example of an extreme interpretation of um, the certainty, uncertainty, risk, low risk uh, way of analysing decisions. The same thing, kind of, the same broad distinction can be applied to almost any decision, including these. You can say, well, when was the decision rationalised and justified? Sometimes we have lots of time to sit and plan and think, well, you know, when this happens, how should we proceed? Sometimes people are in the middle of a moment, they're having to make decisions, and maybe you get a second to pause and think, you know, is this right? Am I doing this the right way? And sometimes, surprisingly often, decisions are made and you're left justifying them afterwards. And I think uh, as a psychologist, that probably isn't ideal because we should be able to sit away from the heat of the moment and analyse and make decisions in advance or at least close to when they're important. If, as a psychologist, you're making important decisions on somebody else's behalf with no real understanding of why you've done it and then going back and saying, well, I guess I can fit that with one of the many theories in my textbook, that's probably very questionable. Now, real people in real life very often end up having uh, made a decision, passively or actively. Uh, you know, It might just be something which accidentally happened around them and it ends up being a decision for life. And they're often understood in, in reverse, so um, post hoc, effectively. But as a psychologist, that probably isn't the way to go. And you do see many case studies of practitioners in training where the work was done, and then you can sort of clearly see that some theory has been picked that probably wasn't that applicable, but at least it helps to capture uh, what was done, or sometimes you get a mixture of theories which are used to explain what was done, and they're not really compatible anyway. And it just looks for all the world like the justification is happening long after the key events took place, which probably isn't what we want to see happening. Just again, a simple ordering of events. One of the important transitions you can get with clients, especially, is to uh, work from post hoc analysis about decisions 
to uh, make it more and more present so that people are able to take control of things in the moment and also to actually begin to plan ahead and say I, I anticipate I will need these skills, I anticipate I will be in a situation which will challenge me again. How can I prepare for that? So you actually begin to bring the um, understanding and the intentionality forwards through time so that rather than sitting as a passenger and waiting to feel good or bad the person actually gets to um, react in the moment with more presence and of course plan ahead and say this is how I want to be as a person and next time something like this happens this is how I want to react to it. That's been a theme of my own sort of practice recently. Um, you could analyse in terms of how involved the client was. So you could say, look, I'm in charge, do as I say. Or you could end up saying, you've got this, I'll just sit back and watch and make sure that you don't um, screw it up too much. Uh, and they're very different types of decisions. And I guess the responsibility is still on the psychologist as the helping professional. Um, so there's still some element of control, perhaps. But it may be that if you're allowing someone much more say in how they proceed that that's more empowering more autonomy and it may stick and work much uh, better and we could even say look was the decision made purely on gut instinct which you might call rules of thumb or heuristics or was it actually made in a calm rational way and any of these are ways of talking about how we make decisions they're all applicable and it could be that any decision we look back on especially we could characterise in this way. So what that means is, almost any decision you make, but certainly this key decision around how to proceed and perhaps intervene or offer a support strategy, almost any of those could be characterised onto a framework like this. So you could say, okay, how much certainty do I have that it's a good or bad decision? How much certainty or how do I have that it will work? And deliver the outcomes that we've been seeking. Uh, how much risk is there? Um, what are the likelihood of, of bad things happening? Uh, do I even know? How bad is the risk? So you could say, okay, um, as we mentioned earlier, there could be something I'm not really certain about at all, but the risks are huge. And in that case, it might be that you choose a very conservative, safe strategy. Whereby, whereas if you've got something which you're pretty sure would work and there's almost no chance of it going wrong, which is often how we like to feel about life, then you could kind of proceed without too much caution. And of course, most of the things that we do will be somewhere in the middle where we don't really know how certain we can be. Um, it's not the end of the world. If it doesn't go to plan, we'd always be able to do something else. But actually in elite sports, sometimes the levels of risk are pretty big. There are big sums of money, uh, you know, one shot in a career kind of stuff. So that changes uh, the way you make decisions. I mentioned a minute ago the idea of madeness, how made is the decision, um, and I talk about a sort of decision threshold whereby um, you know, there's a moment where sometimes a decision is made and once you cross that threshold there's no going back, it's done. Uh, the only change we could do now is to start a whole new list of decisions because we've already taken this key step. Um, versus this kind of, there's a long way between me and the decision you know, and we've got lots of options and we can keep our options open in, uh, until we need to. And there's kind of um, some military theory around trying to sort of protect the decision makers from the urgency so that they can be cold and rational and have that distance uh, so, and look at all the options. Uh, so it's definitely something which has been recognised, if not well researched, that the uh, level of madeness around the decision is it. Um, something which I did and it was done is something where I made a decision uh, to write down the four options and wait and see. And I think sometimes um, entertaining multiple options at once, whilst it leaves you uncertain and incomplete uh, sort of emotional feeling, it actually uh, allows more information to be gathered, it allows people to sometimes just uh, mull over how they would feel if a certain thing if a certain decision was made, how would you feel? Let's just pause and wait. Let's not jump into this. Sometimes there's a real good argument for um, postponing and knocking back the decision down the track a bit. The justification process is it something which you could do um, in advance, a priori, and along. It's sort of okay. 
we thought this through, we came up with our justification, we made sure that it made sense and we were pretty confident when we got there versus decisions which were made in the moment and you barely had a chance to think it through but you might have just had a few seconds to reflect and analyse versus the justification process taking place long after the key decision was actually made and so you're just rationalising afterwards. The authority angle, is it a prescriptive decision where you say I'm in charge, I'm the expert here, you must do as I say? Is there a kind of halfway point where you negotiate and perhaps you say here are some options, which one do you like and it's a back and forth but ultimately I suppose you're agreeing a course of action that the person has to do? Or is it this kind of, you work it out for yourself, you've got this, but my neck's on the line still so I will actually just keep an eye on what you decide to do as the client. And I've used the word regulatory to describe that because you're kind of just keeping checks on what they do and decide. And then the kind of uh, level of analysis that went into the decision. We as humans frequently make decisions that are gut instinct, heuristics. We judge people. We, uh, you know, and it's really important uh, in sport and in just navigating the world that we shortcut some decisions. If we analysed every movement and every basic social interaction um, from scratch, we would really struggle to get anything else done each day. So it's really important to have these short heuristic um, shortcuts, but they are prone to going wrong, and sometimes we haven't yet got the experience to have that shortcut. And of course, they're very unconscious, so we don't always know why we did something, uh, which as a psychologist probably isn't so affordable. So, when we're discussing this, we could say, look, that decision was purely gut instinct, purely heuristic, but now let's go back and analyse it at least. Let's try and understand what happened. Versus decisions which are extremely um, analytical and rational and logical, uh, and that therefore requires a much higher level of cognitive, sophisticated analysis, as opposed to a more kind of unconscious, implicit, um, knee-jerk reaction. Both have their place in the world, and one of the arguments we'll make in our talk about reflection is that we're trying to train ourselves to have good heuristics in the first place and try and expose ourselves to more diverse and challenging situations so that we have well-adjusted heuristics. But um, that is a framework, at least, for analysing any decision, but certainly the vital decision around how you chose the support strategy for your client. So because I wrote this at least, I'd be very happy to see assignments which uh, use these, this language. And it may be that it helps you to convey uh, and show your workings, whoever you're reporting to. Now we move into the idea of the sources of information or the sources of influence in a decision. In a practice decision for a psychologist, a coach, um, sometimes other professions, uh, we have these potential influences. And depending on your philosophy, again, you may draw on those influences differently. So for example, somebody from a, a classical counselling background would probably pay a lot more attention to the case formulation coming uniquely from their client, whereas somebody from a more kind of um, hard science, um, possibly CBT background, might look more at the evidence base more at the kind of textbook theories um, and less at sort of a unique story of their client. And so that there'd be at least equal weighting between case formulation and evidence. Sometimes maybe even more weighting on the evidence base because um, that you know there's a different emphasis in hard science uh, versus counselling which has sort of been construed as soft science. And then we could be into a whole talk around um, ontology and philosophy. But Sticking with this, there's case formulation, evidence-based practice and professional judgments, all of which can and should inform the decision around what to do with your client. You're given different weightings, they may inform each other in important ways, and again if you can explain that, you look extremely clever. If you gloss over it and hope for the best, there's many, many risks involved. So our assignment that we talk about is mainly about showing your workings and making sure that you can explain this in a clear way. 
the case formulation should inform the support strategy. There's an ethical expectation, but certainly a scientific expectation, to use recent, robust evidence. And then there's just these practical elements of personal experience uh, and professional judgment in that respect, and the logical constraints around, you know, how are we going to make this work in real life for this person at this life stage, for example. All three of those, if you can explain them, capture them, convey them somehow, that's useful. That helps the reader or the assessor to understand what happened. And it could be that the client themselves wants to know. And you should ideally be able to explain it in quite simple terms that you know, anybody can relate to. Uh, the danger for sure is leaving things undeclared, implicit, unconscious, because basically if something goes wrong, we've got no idea why. We can't go back and change it or analyse it or understand it. We're just left going, well, what a bad situation that is, which is really unacceptable for a scientific helping profession with a lot of responsibility sometimes. So even if something were to be incorrect or proven ineffective in the long run, if we have this information on this page and in this talk, then we can analyse it, understand it and improve it. So case formulation, uh, I'm recycling this from a previous talk because it's basically the same message. At the end of your needs analysis, the signal that you might have enough information to stop only looking for uh, information is that you can formulate a working model to include the causes and inputs, the surrounding context, the internal workings of this machine, the, that therefore explains what's going on, and you can see how that generates these outputs. As I say, those, that mechanism, that formulation could be from a textbook, could be something you and your client have worked out uniquely in that room, but it's, I think it has to exist. Even if you assume, well, everyone's the same and this works for everyone, that is a case formulation. It's just a particularly risky one and an incomplete one. Um, so, again, we're, and it's difficult there with that one if it breaks. It's difficult to go back and analyse why. And that's often a good rule of thumb. You know, if this doesn't work out, can I at least work backwards um, to fix it? And if we have the assumption, well, this works for everyone and that's ineffective, our whole world is wrong. You know, this works for everyone. No, it doesn't. That's a big issue. The case formulation should, if it's doing its job, point out a small number of potential ways forwards. And I have had sort of first and second year students correctly point out that um, in sports psychology, some of our best theories um, enable almost any outcome. So you give a, a fake client, but you know, quite detailed, and you apply a particular theory, and it means it leaves you with almost any of the possible popular um, approaches. You know, you could do imagery, goal setting, self talk, and you could change the theory and still end up with the same um, potential courses of action. And that's probably a problem. So it might be that our theories are faulty um, and if we're just using them to case formulate we haven't quite got the level of um, precision that we need. So there's a strong chance that um, case formulations more informed by the client's particular story uh, may be more um, sensitive, precise. And the great thing is uh, the case formulation is fallible, it can be replaced easily. You can change the diagram a little bit. It doesn't mean that it's final. You can constantly update it, especially if it's improving. And, and no one's ego or health or anything is at stake uh, in a, if a diagram changes. Uh, it's no sort of personal judgment on, on the practitioner or the client. Whereas, if we're really defensive about our working model and that has to stay the same, then really it's either the practitioner's reputation or the client's health which could be being affected, or their performance for that matter. So if we have to modify anything in there, the chances are the best thing to look at is the case formulation and change that. Evidence-based practice is quite a big issue, and I've got a different lecture on that if you really want to, uh, linked to the end of this. 
fundamentally, uh, our regulations and the fact that we're a scientific discipline mean that we should be using evidence to inform our practice. And the problem with that can be that the evidence out there isn't sufficient to inform practice. So one of my favourite examples, which you might have heard me use before, is uh, um, in motivational climate research, uh, we tend to find that the athletes of a coach, when they fill in their questionnaires, end up showing very different opinions of the coaching motivation climate. And very wildly different uh, and probably more reflective of their own preferences and personality. And their own perceptions predict how happy they are and all sorts of things quite well. But because they're so different and they've all got the same coach, there's almost no way we could say to that coach, ah, well, you need to change your practice. Because everyone's perceiving completely different things about that coach. So if they just looked at our data, they'd say, well, you, how can you possibly say that? It's so inconsistent. And yet, I think it was 54% of studies on this topic conclude by recommending that coaches change their practice. So there's a good example of how the evidence doesn't actually um, justify the recommendations for you know, intervention in this case. That's a recurring issue and it often means that we uh, have to do the best we can with the evidence that we've got. The ideal situation is that we can say, okay, the case formulation suggests a couple of alternatives here. Which one has the best evidence for that particular strategy with uh, this particular outcome that I'm trying to achieve? Because it could be I want to improve performance. It could be I want to improve motivation or confidence or well-being. It could be that I want to um, achieve the best transition between career stages. And they're all different, different outcomes for the same um, technique potentially. And what you sometimes find in sports psychology is that we recommend the same intervention for everything and anything. This intervention will enhance performance, it will boost confidence, it will improve your transition process. It's just brilliant. Panacea of everything. And actually no one's tested whether it fixes all of those things. At best, we've probably got a theory um, suggesting it does and some correlations suggesting that those things might be linked. But we haven't said, if I change this, it changes that outcome, and that's the sort of level we need. So to achieve that, we normally be, need to be testing our proposed intervention against a placebo, or the current best thing that we use as standard practice. We need to have really clear instructions for what we did, so the next person could do it, otherwise you prove that it works, but no one else can do it, so it doesn't work effectively. Um, we need to have tested it on a sufficient sample, um, if we're going to say this works for all elite athletes and we've never worked on, with elite athletes on that thing, that's not a good claim. Uh, and ideally, we need this thing to have been tested by different groups because there's a small chance that one group might have a particular bias or a famous story around a particularly charismatic presenter and everyone liked the presenter so much that it worked wonderfully for them but not for anybody else who tried to do exactly the same programme. In which case we have to conclude maybe the programme doesn't work, it's the actual pre presenter who's doing a lot of the good here. That's the ideal scenario and it pretty much comes from randomised control trials if we want to be claiming this works for everyone. If we don't want to make that claim and we want to be much more nuanced and subtle then we don't necessarily need these, um, this level of evidence and we can be more tentative but that's actually a different um, philosophy, a different approach to how you perform science. And, if, and you can't really transition from saying this definitely works for everyone to, oh, well, everyone's different. That's a, a fundamental shift in underlying philosophy of the world, you know, of, of what you think the world is. If you think everyone's the same, except everyone's different. So it's without getting into philosophy, because that's a different late night conversation, um, we look for this high quality evidence to inform our practice and ideally it should be there you know without doubt we'd want this great evidence showing that these interventions work to achieve these outcomes with these people when it's not there what do we have to do instead well we have to be much more tentative in recommending things 
and we have to build in checks and measures to make sure that um, we are making progress in the right direction. If we haven't got those in place, we're effectively flying blind and again we've, we've stepped away from a scientific process. So professional judgments is the third pillar of this um, decision process and yes they are to a large extent subjective but they're not um, meant to be purely uh, hidden sort of you know, magical mystical background information that you don't get to share so they still need to be something which if possible can be brought into consciousness and explained verbally to other people and evaluated to see if they make sense so uh, case reports should be able to verbalize uh, professional judgments not just say well it felt right and that's, there's an important element here, which is that the practitioner is a vital um, component of the, the entire support strategy. And they will be accumulating implicit, tacit knowledge of what works and what doesn't work and with who and in what circumstances. And actually converting that knowledge, that very carefully hard-earned knowledge, into something which can be shared, evaluated and understood would be a brilliant scientific outcome. It would help us understand how a practice can be optimised. So we should never be leaving it as just background, implicit, unexplained stuff. Also, the practitioner in, the, you know, in this stage in history is the only thing capable of synthesising all that information from case formulation, client data, um, the literature, the immediate context, the only thing in the world that can do that is the practitioner. We're trying to make sure that in due course the client can do that, I guess. But the practitioner is the one who's had all the experience of doing this time and time again. So again, there's really important, vital information which would be really valuable to other people if we could capture it, analyse it, understand it, theorise about it, test it. So to some extent, because professional judgments are more likely to be heuristic and implicit, it's also more likely something which we talk about and rationalise um, post hoc. And if we can bring that forwards to being something we're aware of in the moment, ad hoc, that may mean that we make better decisions. So certainly worth being able to navigate and not just simply leave it as a background um, unexplained event. So I, I use this template with people and you're welcome to take a copy and include it in uh, any case reports that you do where I try and slice a cake in terms of how much of my decision about the support strategy was informed by case formulation how much from evidence-based practice and how much from professional judgment. And of course, logically, you might start from case formulation, have a few ideas, look at the evidence for each of those ideas, and then contextualise them using professional judgment. But then I think in the end, and it depends how many arrows you want to draw, it all kind of feeds into itself and there's this constant interplay of information. Um, and it might be that the... Um, even the attempts to plan change your understanding of the very data that you've got from your client or your attempts to plan change your understanding of the client's goals, the fundamental goals of what they're trying to achieve. So you can draw a lot of arrows here in the end but the sort of logical, um, you know, if it were easy to do, it would be I've got a nice idea what's going on, what does the evidence say and what can I do in real life in that kind of order. I suspect there'll be uh, many situations where that isn't the case. When you finally picked a support strategy, there's still the act of turning it into um, real events in the world. So you would need to plan out what's going to happen. You would need to actually uh, have some outcomes in mind and deliver those outcomes. And some of that will be you, know, you delivering. I guess uh, you'll need to recognise what part of the um, process is the client doing the work and delivering the outcomes but certainly what does it mean you know to deliver something as a psychologist 
There's a big element of monitoring where you need to know whether you're on track, uh, not making progress. And when you've got lots of lead time and you've got an assignment, for example, that um, gives you lots of time to sit and analyse, then you can decide what you're going to choose as your um, key indicator of success and you can simply measure that one thing. Of course, in real life, uh, you don't always get to have that uh, clarity and it's a different type of decision about what to monitor. Uh, D, for example, um, if you're being tentative and suggesting, we'll try this, but if it's not working, we'll have to switch tactic. Do you have a clean point in time where you say, look, at that point, if it's not working by then, we'll change, you know, sort of giving up point. Um, which kind of, there's an element of that might make sense, that might sound very rational and, and clean. Of course, not all uh, applied practice is rational and clean, but, you know, have you got your giving up point or a plan B? Uh, there's chances are those are, if you're looking to write a kind of case study that makes you look and sound clever, you might actually have things like that signposted within it. As I've said, all of these things will be furiously interacting. So case formulation um, could be revised in light of uh, the first attempt to make a change, which didn't work, so you go back and look and change things. But it's a live process, but at least we're trying to give it a language and a way of understanding it and a way of reporting it. So, when I was uh, marking various uh, case studies by practitioners when I was younger, uh, I used to see these interventions which would say, I told the client to do imagery. I told the client to do goal setting. And sometimes people would talk about progression uh, from, we started off doing goal setting and then we progressed to imagery. And that was kind of all the information that you had to work with and it wasn't really cl clear why that represented progress and improvement for the client. It, it sounded almost like a curriculum, just working through the classic mental skills that you see in sports psychology. So it might be, and I think it probably is better, to, to plot a route from where the client wants to be, where you are now, and to link how, those, how you're going to navigate in that direction. And it might be that you have to revise and change as you go, but at least you've got an end point and a beginning point, and you can monitor on that journey. It could be that you have outcomes, performance and process goals, um, taking directly from, from goal setting theory, but if you have the endpoint in mind and you know the strategies you're going to use to get there, the chances are that sounds very logical and sensible. Another way of transitioning is to think about the education, acquisition and practice model that uh, I've used in this and other uh, lectures as well. But if you begin educating a client, not necessarily in a classroom, but you know, giving them tasks that might demonstrate when this problem occurs, um, how to sense that it's happening, how it affects the performance, how it affects their happiness or their life, that opens the way then to start making changes. There might be an acquisition phase whereby you actually do tasks that purely are focused on accumulating and building this skill and practicing it in the sense of practicing to learn. And then there's this practice in terms of putting it into practice. So the P in our model is putting it into practice. Uh, because sometimes people can accumulate a new skill and in a key moment they still can't use it. And there was a study, uh, I think it was Dan Gould, uh, using the Tested Performance Strategies questionnaire which suggested that the elite athletes not only have these skills, but use them in the key moments. And the, the other athletes may often have those skills, but didn't use them at the right times. And that was uh, particularly telling. So if you can think about how I would get from, now you've built this skill up in isolation, away from important moments, how can we make sure that when that key moment comes along, you're ready and you use that skill quite automatically without having to think about it. It's just natural. So a model that progresses in that order probably makes a lot of intuitive sense to a reader. Uh, and a third angle might be to say, okay, the trans-theoretical model suggests that there are stages uh, of pre-contemplation where the person isn't bothered or interested. 
through to contemplation where they're thinking about making a change, preparation where they're actually preparing and taking actions that might begin to um, start that change process. Then there's action when people are actually doing the things that uh, the new behaviour they've chosen to adapt. And then there's maintenance where you've been doing it for more than six months. That's the definition of the maintenance stage. That's also a good way of sometimes planning how I'm going to get someone from where they are now to where they want to be. So we can actually plan using those types of frameworks and again it makes it look like we've really given this some thought. It might be that we delegate some of that to the client and we actually encourage them to go through these processes and we're only simply um, guiding them and that, again a different way of making the decision, a more regulatory way of making the decision. But when it comes to writing it up, there still needs to be some element whereby uh, a pattern is shown. So it's probably harder to sort of sound quite deliberate and um, in control when you're talking about uh, a more counselling style. But actually, you know, that's been a very well written about and very well defended for a long time now. So there probably is a language you can use that even if you've said the client's in control and they can do what they want and I'm just here, you can still make it you know, resonate with the idea of there is a plan and there are key milestones and progress that we're looking to achieve. And the delivering side, and again this is just the kind of the outcome of the decision, a key decision around support strategies, you deliver that support strategy. And the definition of delivering from the dictionary is to do what you say you will do or what people expect you to do. So it's the promised, wanted or expected results. This gets us into a really thorny area. So the example I use is um, student feedback on classes. Quite frequently, um, professors and lecturers deliver what they think is brilliant and scientifically it's been with the best supported type of teaching and it's fully aligned to the aims of higher education but it's not what the students wanted and what the students wanted isn't often what counts as higher education or good teaching so a huge part of getting you know good satisfaction scores from students is to actually um, agree very early on what it is that good education and good university teaching looks like and then do that. And that appears to be one way of getting better student feedback comments, for example. Otherwise, same as our coach I was talking about a minute ago, you might get wildly different opinions uh, from people with the same teacher or different opinions from people with the same coach. So delivering isn't as simple as just doing what you think is right. You have to agree it with your client and clients can change their mind. Students can change their mind as they're being taught and as they're going through uh, psychology support. Sometimes they might change their mind and actually shift into what you think is good practice. And I've certainly been with a uh, client at one point whereby we agreed what I thought was a great plan and the next week uh, that was very much not going to work and I had to do what um, they wanted, which probably wasn't, in my opinion, the best way forwards, but... Um, they would kind of introduced a time pressure to make sure that we had to do it in the next few days or else um, it wasn't going to work. It's the agreement, it's the consensus. So you start asking, right, what do I want to deliver? What does the client want me to deliver? And do those things overlap? If I deliver something world class, but the client didn't want that, you could say I've still failed. So we absolutely have to get this right. And there comes an element of how can I ensure all the time that me and the client are on the same page. And even if they shift the goalposts, I still shift with them if it's appropriate. Or can I drag them back into what we think is the right thing to do? And that also includes a question around who is the client. Because often in organisations you've got the governing body, the club, the coach, and the athlete, and then there's other interested parties, family and friends and teammates, and it's almost impossible to please all of those people. Who is the one who is primarily the client 
Is it the person paying the bill? Is it the person you're sat in front of right now? If they're different, how do you manage that? So it actually raises a whole bunch of difficult issues just in saying, have I delivered? Because again, you could deliver exactly what the athlete wants, but the coach paying the bill is not impressed. So a typical example would be getting someone back in good, it's a good mental health, but you do that by taking them away from playing pressures. And it might be that isn't what the coach wanted at all. So suddenly delivering is um, very difficult to get right. If you can be writing case studies where it sounds like you really knew what you were trying to do, and even if you had to move the goalposts, even, you can write about that being a clear and negotiated process, that's going to sound an awful lot better than, um, in my opinion, I was awesome, next question, which you do see. So we have this in and around the decision process, one decision of choosing a support strategy. You actually get this densely interconnected, richly interacting um, range of decisions. Tracing right back to decisions about philosophy, right back to the decision of the athlete's aims for support in the first place. And yet this is where all the real work is done, where you can finally make a good impact and really help someone, which is the purpose of psychology. Like a lot of things in this area, there's no right and wrong answer. Um, and it's quite, kind of hard to say you've definitely done that wrong. It's almost impossible to say you've done that right. And what we're left with is you'll need to be able to reflect, and that's why this language and terminology is important. You'll need to be sensitive to the key issues, sensitive to the risks, and able to avoid the risks if possible. You'll need to be able to report it, both for university assignments and for supervision, regulation. And if you've got that ability to talk about it in an educated and informed way, then it should mean you can analyse and improve your own practice over the course of your career. So whilst it might sound a bit theoretical sometimes, this could be really valuable information that will last you a lifetime in sports psychology or outside sports psychology. So in summary, the key reading which will feed into your quiz will be uh, the chapter from my book. And the chapters around that are useful for sure, but they won't be in the quiz. They might help you, for example, with your assignment. For those of you who are interested in focusing on evidence-based practice, we've got the link to a different lecture on YouTube about evidence-based practice, drawing from uh, Gardner and Moore's book, Clinical Sports Psychology. Hopefully, something which could have been fairly dry and boring has been brought to life and it's gone from being abstract and theoretical to being something which you can not only do, but understand and talk about and write about. If that's the case, I've done a good job um, and we shall keep going through this until we've uh, understood it all. All the best for now. Never know how you get on and we'll speak soon.